Chapter 2 Of Cats and Catastrophe His feet arced up into the sky. They looked as if they could scrape the clouds. He felt weightless, light and fast and free. The cool breeze of each swing whipped through his hair and against his face, and when he fell backward he would look up at the tree, transfixed by the tangled canopy rushing overhead. There was something else in the branches, looming a little closer with each downward swing. Through the dark of the leaves he could see its eyes shine like tiny suns and its lithe body weave in and out of the tree limbs. Billy closed his eyes as he swung upward. A sound struck his chest like a thunderclap or the roar of a mythical beast. He opened them. The swinging continued, the sky tilting and spinning as it does in a dream, but his vision stayed fixed. It was drawn to one thing. The cat. It was perched on the lowest branch, snaring the boy in its golden gaze. It twitched its whiskers and swished its tail. And then the cat spoke. You shouldn't have come here, it said. The words didn't come from its mouth. They didn't make sound in the air as words do. Instead, they seemed to rise in Billy's mind like ghostly balloons popping gently to reveal themselves. It's my dream, Billy said, reaching out to pet it. As his hand moved closer, the cat blinked. Its pupils swelled, engulfing the gold and blackness. Are you sure, child? The cat dissolved in the smoke. Wisps of black and white swept through Billy's fingers and down the trunk of the great elm. That's not fair, said Billy, stopping the swing. It's not fair that you can do that, and I can't. He spun around looking for some trace of it and saw smoke coming from the old Thomas house, from the windows, and there, on the sill of one, was the cat. Is that what you want? It said, eyes aglow in the haze. To do what I do and know what I know. Billy stumbled towards the house. His legs felt heavy and weak, especially his right one. The wet ground seemed to be sucking at his feet, and he stiffened as he reached the window and met the cat's gaze. That's why I followed you, the boy said. Suddenly, he was no longer standing by the house. He was on the road now, one foot on either side of the faded yellow line that cut down the middle of it. We're so sorry, an elderly voice came from somewhere behind him. Billy turned to meet it. He saw a silver-haired couple, finely dressed. Their heads were bowed, faces creased with age and regret. Behind them sat a vintage chrome and powder blue sedan. Blood dripped from the front fender. It happened so fast, said the old man. You were looking the wrong way. Yes, said the old woman. You were looking down there. She lifted her hand. It was clad in a crisp white glove and pointed north. Billy turned again. The whole world opened up, like he was seeing in all directions at once. There was a large bonfire in the front yard of the Thomas house. It crackled and popped, and a column of dark smoke rose into the sky. The smoke drifted and formed black clouds over the far mountain range. The clouds flashed, and jagged bolts of lightning crashed into the highest peak. He heard a howl then, like the bang of a wolf. The mountaintop exploded sending plumes of stone and fire hurtling into the air. The clouds themselves fell, as if wounded by the burst, striking the horizon. They splashed and rolled and swept down the highway in a black, colossal wave. Billy spun back around. The old couple were gone. The wave swept forward, tearing the trees and farms and houses from the earth in its wake. It began to crest, and the vast blackness of it unfolded, spreading in the sky like the wings of a giant bat. The wind howled, and the sky went dark. Lightning crashed, and the wave stretched higher, billowing like the sails of a great black ship. No more. The boy heard the voice and tried to run, but the water held him fast. He cried out, which did nothing to slow the rising tide or the mammoth's shape upon it. He stood helpless as the sky burned and the earth shook and the black waves swept over him. A pain shot through Billy's leg then, and he remembered. 
He took a deep breath, covered his ears, and clamped his eyes shut. This is only a dream. The storm collapsed around him in the darkness, vanishing like warm mist. A soft, empty silence filled the oasis in his mind. Billy breathed. With each breath, the darkness was pierced like pinholes in the fabric behind his eyes, filling his vision with a shimmering ocean of stars. Billy scanned the constellations, searching for the cluster that had always called to him, the one that held vigil in the lonely night skies of the waking world. Orion. The stars blinked and then trembled. The sky shook as if gripped in a pair of celestial hands. There was a crack of thunder, a frightening hiss, and a buzz that grew to deafening. And then the voice returned. No more! The scream flooded the void. The stars died with it, their light toppling like glittering rows of dominoes. The last to fade were a pair of distant golden orbs, burning to their last before blinking into nothingness. Listen, the voice hissed and buzzed and gurgled. You are with us now. The sound was low and wet and treacherous. Billy felt it closing in and began to panic. He tried to concentrate, to breathe and remember. It's just a dream, he repeated. It's only a dream. A good trick, boy, said the voice. But you'll have to live a long, long time to know what we know. The air grew hot and foul. Billy had had hundreds, maybe thousands of dreams before, but none of them had ever smelled. He choked when he took another breath and felt a sick rising in his chest. It was a reek of filth and garbage and utter decay. It was a smell so awful, so dense and noxious and violent, that Billy feared he would lose his mind. It was the smell of death. Let us see that pretty skin. The hissing grew louder, like a thousand hungry mouths sucking air through rotten teeth. Billy opened his eyes, and for a moment he thought the stars had returned. The darkness had given way to hundreds of tiny blinking lights. But he was wrong. They weren't stars. They glowed red, and they were in pairs. In the cruel and hellish light, Billy saw that he was in a cramped room. Its floor and walls were stone slabs covered in thick, putrid slime, and there were things twitching in the dense shadows, things with eyes, things that moved. Rats. Billy spun around and saw the mouth of a giant tube, a pipe with more rats gathered at the opening. They crawled over each other, lashing their hairless tails in frenzy. The wriggling, oily mound grew and grew, eyes blazing like hot embers and smothering smoke. We have waited so long, we have forgotten. It was lost, said the voice. And Billy looked up to its origin. Something emerged from the darkness above and crouched on the rim of the pipe. Something big. No, we find it. The thing looked human. It had arms and legs and what appeared to be a man's body. It was clothed in a quilt of soiled rags, like a cloak that had been sewn together from countless old garments. A filthy patchwork hood concealed its face. Where am I? Billy cried. What do you want? The room filled with hissing. The shadowy thing lifted a limb and raised a skeletal hand to its face. Its eyes flared with crimson fire like the rat's eyes did, and the sudden light revealed the true horror of it. Sallow, rotting flesh. A gaping hole where a nose should be. An impossibly wide mouth filled with jagged, broken teeth. Black, cavernous eyes cradling stars of angry fire. It was the terrible face of the Gray Man. Listen, hissed the Gray Man pressing a bony finger to diseased lips. That is what you do. You will listen, and we will remember. Then you will help us find it. The rats squealed and shrieked in chorus, and the room rumbled. 
Billy backed away from the thing and the rats and the ominous sound coming from the pipe. It was only a few steps before he felt the cold, slimy stones against his back. Again, Billy was trapped. Water burst from the pipe, sweeping the frenzied mass of eyes and teeth towards him. The water rose and the rats with it, churning the flow as they swam. They clung to him, to his arms and his legs, to his skin and his hair, and as the water passed Billy's knees, they began to bite. Get off me, the boy screamed. I want to wake up. The gray man stood to his full height, eyes ablaze and arms outstretched. His hands tensed and his body went rigid. From the darkness above him, something descended. Four squares of stone. The shapes hovered in the air, forming an arc above his head. We can smell it on you. The key is close. The gate shall open. The gray man snarled, his voice drowning out the rising water and squealing vermin. The one who hears through the veil of tears, with the fang or the great cat's maw, you will help us. The water was up to Billy's chest, and the rats had doubled their attack. They swarmed around his face and dove underwater to gnaw on his injured leg. He swatted and squeezed and hurled as many as he could, but they kept coming. The stench in the air, the sight of his own blood, and the thought of his imminent drowning crippled the boy with dread. I will, Billy shouted. Just make it stop. The air grew hot and the stones floating above the gray man's head burst into flames. In the fiery light, Billy could see carved shapes on the four slabs. Symbols. The gray man grinned, clapped his hands twice, and the stones vanished. The rats continued to tear at the boy's flesh. The flood rose up to his chin. Billy choked and cried as he struggled in vain. He was alone in the dark at the false mercy of a demon from his dreams. Please! He begged, fearing that his next breath would be his last. Please, help me. That's when Billy heard it over the rush of water in his ears. The scratching. Just to the left of his head. He turned and gulped at the air, willing to use his last breath to show them that a boy's bite could be just as fearsome as a rat's. A chunk of rock wiggled in the wall. The rock popped free in a spray of dust and splashed into the chamber. Follow, urged a voice from within the hole. Hurry. The words gave the boy a glimmer of hope, and that was enough. Billy closed his eyes, swallowed his fear, and changed the rules of the dream. With a thought, his body shrank to a fraction of its size, and the rising waters lifted him into the hole in the slimy stone wall. Faster, a shadow called from deep in the tunnel. You have to come back. Billy clutched to the loose earth and began to crawl. We know you can hear us. The tunnel shook with the gray man's bellow, and dirt fell around Billy's head. He lunged forward, dragging himself on his hands and knees. The way quickly grew more narrow and steep. He stopped to catch his breath, and the voice hissed again. Closer. We curse you, listener. This will never end, Billy thought, fresh fear exploding in his chest. I'm doomed. Something clamped around his wrist and pulled. It felt like a very strong hand, rough and soft at the same time, and much larger than a man's. We curse you. The hand squeezed and then dragged the boy fast through the tightening passage of dirt and stone. Billy hurtled through the end of the tunnel, squinting as he tumbled onto a clean, smooth surface. The air smelled amazing. Billy knew that it was the most amazing smell from the most amazing meal he would ever eat. He took a deep breath. A beautiful warmth filled his belly, draining the fear from him. He rubbed his eyes and saw that he was back in his house, in the kitchen to be precise, but a much better version of it. It had mosaic tiles, cherry cupboards, and a large wooden island in the middle. It looked just like his mother had always wanted it to. Billy looked around the room and saw that he wasn't alone. The kitchen was full of people making a feast. 
He saw his mother and father and even some kids from his school. There were adults that he knew and others that he didn't recognize. Mrs. Thomas was there. She was standing off to the side by the kitchen window, the sun making a halo of her silver hair. She wore a bright white dress that flowed in the breeze as the window swung open. She held out her hand as if waiting to catch something. A white bird flew into the room and landed on her fingers. Mrs. Thomas lifted it to her ear and listened to it chirp. She nodded and turned to look at Billy with a bittersweet smile. It's all right, she said. Whatever happens, we just wanted to thank you. Everyone in the kitchen turned then, as if suddenly realizing he was there. Welcome, Welcome back, they cheered. His father poured a glass of beer and raised it to him. Others followed suit, and his mother wiped gleaming tears from her cheeks as the room burst into applause. Billy stared up from the floor in disbelief. He wanted to cling to this moment as long as he could, to bask in their unexpected kindness. But he knew it wasn't real. He was still dreaming. At any moment, even this perfect one, the nightmare could return. He felt something brush against his leg. The thought of more rats sent him sprawling backward, kicking at the air as he fell to the floor. The room laughed and applauded some more. You're safe now, Mrs. Thomas said, calming him with the creamy jade of her gaze. Close your eyes and rest. Billy did as she asked, and the room hushed as he lay down on the floor. He felt something brush against his leg again and put his weight upon it. The weight moved, shifting to his groin, then his belly, until coming to rest on his chest. You can wake up now. Billy opened his eyes and jerked his head up with a gasp. He rubbed his face, caught his breath, and even bit the inside of his lip to make sure that he was awake. His parents stood beside the cot. It was clear by the confusion on their faces that they saw it too. It was right there in black and white on the boy's chest, still and silent and staring right at him, just like it did the day of the accident, just like it did in his dream. The cat with the golden eyes.